Okay. Good evening and welcome to the 1916 Committee of Rhode Island monthly lecture series. I want to say initially that we are honored here, everyone here in Rhode Island, to have members of the McAway family attending this meeting. McCreesh. McCreesh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just a little nervous. Tonight's lecture will continue the committee's commemoration of the 1981 hunger strike. On May 8th, we held a commemoration at the Galway Bay Irish Pub. Almost 100 people attended, including the governor of Rhode Island and the mayor of Pawtucket. Appropriate rebel songs were performed by Sean Connell and Carolyn Reeves. Personal memories of 1981 were offered by Father Bernie O'Reilly and Norma Jenks, both members of Rhode Island NORAID at the time of the hunger strike. We also heard personal reflections from Trisha MacGyver, who was a 14 year old student and actually attended one of the hunger strikers wake in Derry. In addition, George Doyle compiled a souvenir booklet that contained many memories of people from Rhode Island, Belfast, Derry, and even one from a former Long Cash prisoner, Shana Walsh. The event was a very fitting tribute in this, the 40th anniversary of the strike. Tonight, we will take a different approach to honoring the brave men of 1981. Some brief background. The hunger strike did not occur spontaneously. Rather, the hunger strike was the result of a five-year prison protest that began in 1976 when Karen Nugent refused to put on a prison uniform. Until that year, Republican prisoners were classified as special category prisoners. They were actually political prisoners who were charged under special laws, tried in special courts, and sentenced under special circumstances. More than 700 Republican prisoners eventually refused to wear a convict's uniform and remain naked in their cells with only a blanket to cover them. This eventually led to a no-wash protest, protest, and as conditions continued to deteriorate, a hunger strike commenced. The prisoners had five very legitimate demands. One, the right to wear their own clothes. Two, the right to do no prison work. Three, the right of free association with other prisoners. The right to, four, the right to have one visit, one letter, and one package delivered per week. And five, the remission of any additional sentence for their protest. This is how Republican prisoners were treated before 1976. These are all very legitimate demands, of course, but stonewalled by the British government. But as was stated in the 1916 committee email that went out earlier this week, it is only natural that the first to die, Bobby Sands, who was also the commanding officer of the Republican prisoners at Long Kesh, has received the most publicity and attention over the years. But this program tonight aims to pay equal attention to the other nine men. It is obvious that each of them experienced horrific and painful deaths. Equally, each of their families suffered in great measure as they watched their son, brother, father, cousin, or friend sacrifice for a higher cause than life itself. And all because the British government tried to prove the prisoners had no community support and were ordinary criminals. Well, the events of the spring and summer of 1981 proved that these were no ordinary men and that their sacrifice has changed the course of Irish history. One small story that I have shared often. In early 1982, 
there was a gun battle between IRA members and IUC police. An IUC policeman was killed. His funeral was attended by 5,000 or more people. After the funeral, the newspaper interviewed his wife. His wife said, well, it was great that all these people came out for my husband's funeral, but life will go on and soon everyone will forget about him, just like everyone will forget about the 10 boys who died in 1981. Well, we have committed ourselves to not let that happen. We will always remember, we will never forget. We will now begin the program with a song, as the Irish often do. Here is Carolyn Reeves to sing Song for Marcella, written by Bick McFarlane on the 10th anniversary of Bobby Sands' death. But the song certainly applies to the other nine men as they all showed us how freedom's fight can be won. Carrie. Thank you, Uncle Jim. Hello to everybody and a special to hello to our friends in Northern Ireland. Thank you for staying up late, hanging out with us. It is definitely an honor to sing this song. Doesn't seem quite so long ago The last time that I saw you and Ain't it funny how the memories grow they seem to always fold around you They try to break you in a living hell But they couldn't find a way So they killed you in a hedge block cell and thought that all would fall away. They thought your spirit couldn't rise again. But you dare to prove them wrong And in death you tore away the chain And let the world hear freedom song But the heartache and the pain Linger on, they're still here Though it's so long since you've gone But we're stronger now You showed us how Freedom's fight can be won. I wish there was an easy road to choose to bring the heartache to an end but easy roads are always sure to lose I've seen 
seen it time and time again If you could stand by me like yesterday I'd find the strength to carry on So let your spirit shine along the way And our day will surely come Yet the heartache and the pain linger on They're still here Though it's so long since you've gone But we're stronger now You showed us how Freedom's fight can be won If we all stand as one Okay, that was beautiful, Carrie, as always. Now we'll begin the speaking program that we have planned for this evening. This is always exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Bobby Sands was born on March 9th, 1954 and spent his early years in a predominantly loyalist district of North Belfast. Even as a child, he was personally affected by the deep religious and political divisions in Northern Ireland. When he was just 10 years old, his family was forced to move out of their home due to loyalist intimidation. He left school in 1969 at the age of 15 and enrolled in Newton Abbey Technical College, beginning an apprenticeship as a bus builder at Alexander's Coach Works. He worked there for about a year, enduring constant harassment from his unionist co-workers, which according to several other employees, he ignored completely as he was focused on learning a meaningful trade he was eventually confronted after leaving his shift in January 1971 by a number of his co-workers who were wearing the armbands of the local Ulster Loyalist Tartan Gang. He was held at gunpoint and told that Alexander's was off limits to quote unquote Finian scum and to never come back if he valued his life. He later said that this event was the point at which he decided that militancy was the only solution. Around the same time, the Sands family was again forced to leave their home due to loyalist intimidation. The loss of his home again and the loss of his job led to Bobby making the decision to join the Irish Republican Army. It should go without saying that the circumstances he was now living under were very different from his life as an apprentice. Bobby described it in these words, quote, My life now centered around sleepless nights and standbys, dodging the Brits and calming nerves to go out on operations. But the people stood by us. The people not only opened the doors of their homes to lend us a hand, but they opened their hearts to us. I learned that without the people, we could not survive, and I knew that I owed them everything." End quote. Bobby was imprisoned in 1972, 
and again in 1976. While in jail, Bobby grew quite popular among other protesting prisoners. He was a prolific writer and contributed to the Sinn Féin newspaper. He entertained the other prisoners with recited and original stories, often told in Gaelic, which he had taught himself. He continued writing his own poetry and he kept a, a diary of his days on hunger strike. He also focused on his love for ornithology by tracking birds from his jail cell. On March 1st, 1981, Bobby Sands began his hunger strike. He died on May 5th, 1981 after 66 days without food. He was 27 years old. I will end with one of Bobby's most repeated and profound quotes. Our revenge will be the laughter of our children. Bobby Sands, Irish freedom fighter. Francis Hughes was the second man to join the hunger strike and the second to die. He was known as either Francis, Frank, or Francie. One name which he should be remembered by is Fearless Francis Hughes. He was born on February 28, 1956 in Balahi in County Derry into a Republican family. His father was involved in the IRA during the 1920s and an uncle was a gun runner. When he was 15 years old, an older brother was taken by British soldiers and held for eight months during Operation Demetrius. Two years later, he and a friend returning home from a dance were stopped by members of the Ulster Defense Regiment and was beaten so badly that he was bedridden for days. He vowed to get his own back on the people who did it and their friends. He left school at the age of 16 working as an apprentice painter and decorator under a brother-in-law. It was mentioned that while on the run, he would paint and decorate safe houses that he stayed in. One story had him painting window frames on a house where he was staying, and when some British troops drove past, he cheerfully waved to them. Others in the house were frozen with apprehension, but he just continued with painting. He was committed to the armed struggle, Seeing himself as a soldier, he would dress the part. He used this to his advantage at times. Once British soldiers thinking he was a part of the UDF or UDR let their guard down and he ambushed them. On another occasion in 1977, he was in a car and when he and the other passengers tried to outmaneuver a roadblock, they ended up in a ditch. They shot their way out of the situation. Some of the Republicans were captured and a British soldier was killed, but Francis Hughes escaped. Another story which demonstrates his fearless nature was, one evening he and some comrades were walking through a field, when questioned, told the soldiers that it was a shortcut and it was not safe to be out on the road. The soldiers thinking that they were unionists, let them pass. He walked on a bit and then turned back and asked for a cigarette. It was because of exploits like this and his readiness to use a gun that he was named the most wanted man in Northern Ireland. He was eventually captured on St. Patrick's Day in 1979. This came after a gunfight with British soldiers the night before. He was seriously wounded, spending months in the hospital. He was then tried, sentenced, and sent to Long Cash. He decided to join the hunger strike in 1981, even though he was asked to not to join by the IRA. He started his strike on March 15, 1981. When he began his hunger strike, he feared that due to the injuries he suffered from the gunfight before his capture, he may die before Bobby Sands. He eventually succumbed at 5.49 p.m. on May 12, 1981, one week after Bobby Sands. When his family tried to transport his body from the mortuary in Belfast back to Derry, 
PIRUC stopped the hearse and the procession of cars that the family was in. The driver of the hearse quickly put the keys into his mouth to prevent the officers from gaining access to the back. In the ensuing melee, Francis DeHue's father was knocked to the ground. This all was captured on film by a foreign television crew. You can see this on YouTube. It appears that in death, as in life, he was a wanted man. A quote from Francis Hughes, I have no prouder boast to say, I am Irish and have been privileged to fight for the Irish people and for Ireland. If I have a duty, I will perform it to the full in the unshakable belief that we are a noble race and that chains and bonds have no part of us, end quote. Fearless Francis Hughes, Irish freedom fighter. The third IRA volunteer to join the hunger strike was 24-year-old Raymond McCreesh, a quiet, determined country boy, country boy from the village of Camlock in South Armagh, and who on May 21st would make the ultimate sacrifice, giving his life for the cause of freedom and for his comrades. He was the seventh child in a family of eight, born into a well-respected working class Republican family in a staunchly nationalist area in which the family had deep roots. They were a family of modest means living in a small semi-detached council house and they were devout Catholics and religion played an important part in Raymond's upbringing. His brother Brian would later become a priest. Raymond was described as a very intelligent young man and no doubt could have carved out a professional career for himself as his siblings did. But instead, he chose to dedicate his life to the cause of Irish freedom. He had a keen interest in Irish history and the Irish language, and he developed a strong nationalist philosophy at an early age. During his formidable years, he witnessed many injustices. The ruling government had proclaimed a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Raymond witnessed discrimination, gerrymandering, vicious attacks on civil rights marchers and state-sponsored murders of innocent Catholics. And he felt compelled as a teenager to take action. At the age of 16, Raymond joined the Fianna Aaron and later that year, he joined the Irish Republican Army's 1st Battalion, South Armagh. His comrades have described him as a quiet, good-humoured and well-liked and dedicated young man. He was small in stature with curly blonde hair and a boyish face. He was renowned for his laughter, always having a wee smile on his face. Cardinal Thomas O'Fee, who was a friend of the family, would later describe him is a quiet, soft-spoken, reticent lad with an angelic smile. As an IRA member, he demonstrated remarkable self-discipline and maturity, adopting a low security conscious profile, rarely drinking alcohol, and if occasionally in the pub, he never spoke of politics or his activities. Such was his discretion that he never came under any suspicion from the British forces and was able to use his job as a milkman to gather significant intelligence on British army patrols. Mm. During those years, his activities consisted of largely landmine attacks and ambushing enemy soldiers. He demonstrated leadership, carefully considering pros and cons of each operation, but he never panicked or lost his nerve. The operation which led to his capture took place on June 26, 1976. The objective had been to ambush a covert British operation post. The British Army, upon discovering the IRA volunteers, opened fire indiscriminately. Raymond and fellow volunteer Patty Quinn made their escape under heavy fire to a local house which was quickly surrounded by bloodthirsty paratroopers. Even as the volunteers surrendered and came out of the house with hands in the air, 
the paratroopers opened fire and they were forced to retreat back inside. Eventually, the RUC and a local priest appeared and the volunteers were able to surrender. They were taken to Bessbrook Barracks where they were questioned and beaten for three days before being charged. After nine months on remand in Crumlin Road Jail, Raymond was tried and sentenced in a non-jury court. By the time he embarked on his hunger strike, Raymond had spent four grueling years on the blanket protest, during which he forfeited all his visits rather than wear a prison uniform. The only family member to see him during that time was his brother, Father Brian, who occasionally said mass in the H blocks. Raymond took his first visit in 1981 with his parents to inform them that he was going on hunger strike. His brother Brian would later write about that visit. My mother didn't know him. His hair, which used to be fair to light brown, was now black. The only feature she recognized was his teeth. When he told them of his intentions of going on hunger street strike, my mother began to cry. But Raymond said to her, don't be crying, mommy. Hold your head high and be proud. He embarked on that hunger strike on March 22nd. He held no illusions about what lay ahead and his resolve to hunger strike to the death was summed up in a letter smuggled out of the H blocks and written to his close friend, Paddy Quinn, in which he wrote, there's a chance I'll be home before you, my friend. As Raymond lay in a hospital bed, his family continued to campaign for him. His brother, Father Brian, spoke at a rally in tomb. My brother is not a criminal, he said. Those immortal words will forever capture the sentiment of the struggle. They evoke powerful emotions, sorrow, anger, frustration, but also pride, resolve, and determination. As the end neared for Ray, his brother, Father Brian, recounted the story of one of his visits. After the warders told us the visit was over, I said some prayers in Irish, and as we said goodbye, Raymond raised his hand and said in Irish, Beanbua agin go foil. Translated means, we will win yet. Those words are now inscribed on his gravestone. Raymond died at 2.11 a.m. on Thursday, May 21st after 61 days on hunger strike. Brave soldier of Ireland, Raymond McCreesh, Irish freedom fighter. Patsy O'Hara, a determined and courageous dairyman. 23 year old Patsy was the former leader of the Irish National Liberation Army prisoners in the H blocks and joined Raymond McCreesh, an IRA volunteer on hunger strike on March 22nd, 1981. Three weeks after Bobby Sands, one week after Francis Hughes. His family lived above the public house and grocery shop his parents owned in Derry. His oldest brother, Sean, interned in long cash for almost four years. The second eldest, Tony, was imprisoned in the H blocks throughout Patsy's hunger strike. He had two older brothers and a younger sister. Mrs. O'Hara, Patsy's mother, was quoted as saying, the trait of courage which Patsy was to show in later years was in him from the start. No matter who got into trouble in the street outside, Patsy was the boy to go out and do all the fighting for him. His sister Elizabeth referred to Patsy as being a mad hatter, making the family laugh and playing pranks on them. Patsy witnessed <clears throat> at a peaceful march that turned violent 
at the waterside station, people being beaten to the ground, the use of water cannons, followed by the riots in January 1969, and the Battle of the Bogside in August 1969. That aroused passionate feelings of republicanism. Every day was something different happening. People getting beaten up, raids and coffins coming out. This was his environment. Patsy was also moved by the peaceful march prior to the violence. The mood of the crowd was one of solidarity. The crowds came in the thousands from every part of the city as they moved down the Duke Street chanting slogans, one man, one vote, and singing, we shall overcome. He had the feeling that a people united and on the move were unstoppable. Mr. O'Hara, his father was quoted as saying, personally speaking, I knew he would get involved. It was in his nature. He hated bullies all his life, and he saw big bullies in uniform, and he would tackle them as well. When Mrs. O'Hara was asked how she felt about her son being a hunger striker, she replied, at first she thought they would get the demands they were asking for. Uh, it wasn't much anyway, but afterwards she said, there's no use in me sitting back in the wings and letting someone else's son go on. Someone's sons had to go on it. I just happened to be the mother of that son. Patsy was arrested on May 14th, 1979 and charged with possession of a hand grenade. In January, 1980, he was sentenced to eight years in prison and went on the blanket protest. Patsy grimly declared, we stand for the freedom of the Irish nation so that future generations will enjoy the prosperity they rightly deserve, free from foreign interference, oppression, and exploitation. The real criminals are the British imperialists who have thrived on the blood and sweat of generations of Irishmen. They have maintained control of Ireland through force of arms, and there is only one way to end it. I would rather die than rot in this concrete tomb for years to come. Patsy O'Hara died at 11.29 p.m. on Thursday, May 22nd, 1981, same day as Raymond McCreesh. They were on the hunger strike for 61 days. Patsy would have been 63 today. Patsy O'Hara, Irish freedom fighter. Joe McDonald was born on Slate Street in the Lower Falls Road section of Belfast on September 14, 1951. He was the fifth of eight children. He was well known and respected in the Andersonstown suburb of West Belfast, a working class area with strong Irish nationalist and Irish Catholic ties. Joe had a reputation as a quiet, deep thinking individual with a happy-go-lucky personality but he also was known to be a cool and efficient volunteer who did what he had to do and never talked about it later. He was captured with his good friend, Bobby Sands, while both were on active IRA duty. Appropriately, when Bobby Sands finally succumbed to starvation on the 66th day of his hunger strike, Joe McDonald, a 30-year-old father of two young kids, volunteered to take his place. His story is that of a Republican adversary whose involvement stemmed initially from the treatment he and his family suffered at the hands of the Northern Irish Royalists and the occupying English Army during the Troubles. Joe MacDonald considered both parties to be Ireland's enemies as British and Unionist treachery denied Ireland its freedom while attempting to criminalize Ireland's people. He and his wife, Gertie, were married in 1970 and lived with their sister's family on Lenadoon Avenue in Belfast, where they were one of only two nationalist households in a predominantly loyalist section. One night, a loyalist mob in full view of a British army post nearby broke through the front doors of each house and forced the two families to flee for their lives. 
Shortly after the Brits introduced internment in 1972, their army raided the McDonald's dwelling on Lenadoon Avenue, and at 4 a.m., Joe was dragged from the house and beaten before taken to the prison ship Maidstone. Later, he was moved to Long Cash internment camp and held there for several months. Upon his release from Long Cash, Joe McDonald had had enough. He joined the IRA's Belfast Brigade, which later described him as a first-class operator who showed no fear. His wife, Grady, called, recalling how that raid on their home in 72 wrecked their lives, said, one minute we had everything, the next minute we had nothing. The Brits continued to persecute Joe and his family. During his interments, their home on Lindenoon Avenue was regularly ripped apart and trashed. And he was often stopped and searched if he left the house after his relief from prison. Joe was captured along with Bobby Sands following the bombing attack on the Balmoral Furnishing Company in West Belfast in October of 1976. The store sold extravagantly priced furniture and was selected as an economic target by the IRA. Bobby Sands led the operation, assisted by Joe McDonald and other experienced Republican volunteers two of whom were shot and were seriously wounded in the ensuing gun battle. Both Sands and Joe McDonald, along with two others, were arrested after the shootout. They had attempted to bluff their way to freedom by hopping into a parked car and claiming to be visiting the area in search of work. At their trial in 1977, all four received 14 year sentences after refusing to even recognize the court, although the only evidence connecting them in any way to the bombing was a single revolver found in the car. From the day of their sentencing, their garb consisted of blankets. They refused to wear the uniforms other criminal prisoners wore, and they demanded political recognition. At 5.11 a.m. on July 8, 1981, after 61 days without food, Joe McDonald died of starvation. Patrick Pierce was quoted in, Jews, in Joe's eulogy. Having given his all, he may seem the fool by the wise men of the world, but it was just such apparent fools who changed the course of Irish history. Joe McDonald, Irish freedom fighter. I am very proud to be on the strike for my principles and very proud to be a Republican, Martin person. At the age of 24, Martin Herson was the sixth hunger striker to die. He passed on the morning of July 13, 1981, which was his 46th day on hunger strike. As news of his death spread across Northern Ireland, the people went out onto the pavement in their local communities and rattled bin lids and whistles to mock the ultimate sacrifice of another young man in Ireland's name. Martin's parents, Johnny and Mary Ann, named him Edward Martin Herson. He was born on September 13, 1956, in a whitewashed farmhouse in Kappa near Dungannon, County Tyrone, which was a Catholic area surrounded by Unionists and Loyalists. The Catholic area of Kappa was hilly and poor in contrast to the flourishing and rich fields owned by the neighboring Unionists and Loyalists. Martin was from a very ordinary Irish family where family connections, being a good neighbor, having a strong Catholic faith, and playing Gaelic football for the local club in Galbally were key features. Young Martin Herson is recalled as being a religious, easygoing, but hardworking young man with a great sense of humor. Martin started his work life at age 17 before moving to live in England with his brother. He didn't like living in England, so he returned home and started to work for Power Screen International. His father proudly said he never missed a day's work. Martin met his fiance, Bernadette Donnelly, at a family wedding. However, as he traveled to visit with Bernadette, he was often stopped and subjected to several severe beatings by the British Army regiments and RUC who were patrolling the hills of Kappa, as well as the streets of Belfast and Derry. The unfair treatment of Catholics and the brutal treatment of young Irish men and women by the British Army and the RUC was a daily occurrence for Martin and his neighbors in Kappa. They would have heard the daily news about the troubles, 
and would have known about the civil rights movement, yet it is reported that the Herson family did not discuss politics. In 1975, at the age of 19, Martin was unable to sit and watch his family and neighbors suffer. He could no longer accept the unfair treatment and harassment from the British forces, so he joined the IRA. In 1976, Martin was taken from his bed in his home by the British forces. He was brutally interrogated and professionally tortured about IRA operations in East Tyrone while held in an Omar IUC barracks. Martin endured long, intense and severe interrogations from the regional crime squad. As he heard his neighbor, who was arrested at the same time, scream with pain from the torture, Martin signed four statements admitting involvement in all Republican activities. It should be noted that members of the regional crime squad received promotion when they got signed statements. Martin was charged and was sent to Crumlin Road Jail in Belfast. And two weeks later, he was remanded to Lankesh internment camp before appearing in court. No one was surprised that the signed statements were ruled inadmissible by the judge. But instead of Martin walking free, the judge went on to accept other statements extracted under threat of renewed torture he was sentenced to the eight blocks of Longkesh. One cannot imagine what the Herson family went through while Martin was on the hunger strike. It was reported that his family stood by his decision. Possibly their humble upbringing and strong Catholic faith gave them strength. It is reported that rosary beads and a medal of St. Martin given to Martin by his family were returned to the family after he died. Here is a poem that Martin wrote on Easter 1981, an appeal to support for his comrades on hunger strike. What compels young men to die, a death so long and cruel, to suffer years of pain and shame in solitary in jail? I speak of men like Hughes and Sands, O'Hara and Lucretia, laying in the blocks of hell where brutality is released, untold pain, heartaches, restless, lonely nights, where men find strength within their hearts to stand for what is right. Oppression equals slavery and resistance stems from both. And those who fight to end it are soldiers of the truth, no matter if they recognize the truth in here or not, the products of these years of pain upon them they have brought. The hunger strike where young men die, not for glory, not for gain, but for recognition of the wars raging through our land lying in their beds this night, just bones and clinging flesh, pale and ashen, cold and worn in the H blocks of Wonkesh. They are dying for the people's cores, not their own or foreign greed. Martin Hurst is buried in his native soil, the soil of the land he gave his life for. He is forever home, Irish freedom fighter. Kevin Lynch, when lauding the memory of the INLA hunger striker Kevin Lynch, one of three Republican socialist prisoners who died in 1981, we must not forget the complex history of the group he chose and the cause he died for. Born on May 25th, 1956, Kevin Lynch was the youngest of a family of eight in the tiny village of Park eight miles outside Dungiven. Patty Lynch's family was established in Park for at least three generations, but they moved to Dungiven, a nationalist center, after the birth of their children. Patty Lynch was a builder by trade, a trade which he handed down to his five sons. Kevin himself was an apprenticed bricklayer. Kevin's great passion, however, was the Gaelic games playing right half back for St. Patrick's Hurling Club, which was representing County Derry at the inaugural Fianna Gael held in Turles, County Tipperary. In 1971, Kevin's performance was considered the key factor in the team's victory in a four-match competition that was played over two days. The following season, Kevin was appointed captain of both St. Patrick's Hurling team and the County Derry under-16 team, which went on in that season to beat Armagh in the All-Ireland Under-16 final at Croke Park in Dublin. He was a champion hurler. 
He was also a boxer with the St. Canisius Club, reaching the county dairy final as a schoolboy. But I, do, I don't think he managed it so easily to achieve victories in every fight as he did in his first fight. Before that match was due to start, his opponent turned and asked him how many previous fights he'd had. With suppressed humor, Kevin answered 33, so convincingly that his opponent overcome with nervous horror couldn't be persuaded to get into the ring. Kevin never lost his sense of humor and his athleticism. As a member of the INLA, Lynch was tried, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years for stealing shotguns, taking part in a punishment shooting, and conspiring to take arms from the security forces. He was sent to Long Kesh in December 1977. He became involved with the blanket protest, joined the 1981 hunger strike on 23 May 1981, and died 71 days later on August 1st, 1981. Having recited these bare facts, we still have not learned much about Kevin Lynch, his inner life, his goals, his dreams. As one of the hunger strikers who are not provost, Kevin took his place in the hunger strike after the death of his friend and fellow INLA member, Patsy O'Hara. The INLA sprung from the official IRA. They had always, the officials had always maintained a Marxist emphasis on class struggle and the role of the working class. The INLA, that is the Inter Irish National Liberation Army, took up the internationalist anti-imperialist program advocated by leaders like Mao Zedong and Ho Chi Minh to wage a war against imperialism. The INLA saw the conditions of Northern Ireland as that of an oppressed colony of England. The INLA connected this with struggles in Vietnam, Nigeria, Angola, Nicaragua against the control of European powers like England, France, Portugal, and Spain. We should remember that the American involvement in Vietnam began with early aid and support for the French occupiers of that country. I don't know the degree to which Kevin Lynch embraced the anti-imperialist agenda of the INLA. Maybe his choice of whom to march with was more like the one Dominic Bean describes in his song, The Patriot Game. I wandered away with the local battalion of the bold IRA. Maybe Kevin's friends and neighbors were that local battalion of the INLA, and he joined them. The, inv the inciting incident that propelled Kevin Lynch into action happened, however, when returning home from a local dance, he and nine other friends were attacked by British soldiers and given a terrible beating. Kevin joined the INLA around this time, maybe because of this incident in part, but almost certainly because his national awareness was growing and made him determined to stand up both for himself and his friends. He would never allow himself to be walked on, recalls Kevin's brother, Michael. He was known for his loyalty to his family, his friends, his teammates, and eventually to his H block comrades. Within the short space of three months, Kevin's active Republican involvement came to an end almost before it had begun. Following an ambush outside Dungiven in, 19, in November uh, 1976, he was in which an RUC man was slightly injured. The RUC moved against those it suspected to be the INLA activists in the town of Dungiven. On December 2nd, 1976, at 5.40 a.m., Brits and the RUC came to the Lynch home for Kevin. We said he wasn't going anywhere before he'd had a cup of tea, remembers Mrs. Lynch, but they refused to let him have even a glass of water. The RUC said he'd be very well looked after by them. Also arrested that day and done given were Sean Coyle, Seamus McGrandles, and Kevin's schoolboy friend, Liam McCloskey, with whom he was later to share an H block cell. Kevin was taken straight to Castlereagh, and after three days questioning on Saturday, December 4th, he was charged and taken to Limavadi to be remanded in custody by a special court. 
following the year on remand in Crumlin Road Jail, Belfast, he was tried and sentenced to 10 years in December 1977. Immediately he joined the blanket men in H3 and eventually found himself sharing a cell with his Dungiven friend and comrade, Liam McCluskey, continuing to do so until he took part uh, in the, joined the hunger strike in May, 1981. He died 71 days later. The Dungiven hurling team was renamed the Kevin Lynch Hurling Club in his honor after his death. Someone remarked, we may listen to them as voices from the past, but their voice will always be heard leading us into the future. That's certainly true of Kevin Lynch, Irish freedom fighter. Karen Doherty. He was the third son in a family of six. He was born in the Anderson Town area of Belfast and was educated at St. Teresa's Primary School and Glen Road Christian Brothers School. The Doherty brothers were known cyclists and sportsmen in the Anderson Town area. Karen won an Antrim Gaelic football medal at minor level in 1971. He joined Fina Aaron in 1971 and was interned by the British government between February 1973 and November 1975. Karen's brothers Michael and Terence were interned between 1972 and 1974. He worked as an apprentice heating engineer. His girlfriend was Gerald, Geraldine Shesh. They were never formally engaged, but became very close towards the end of his life. In fact, before his arrest, she didn't know he was involved in the IRA. In August 1976, while he was out to set a bomb, the van he was in was chased by the RUC. During the chase, he left the van and hijacked a car. He ditched the car and was found a mile away from the car. He was convicted and sentenced to 18 years for possession of firearms and explosives with another four years for hijacking. He started his hunger strike on the 22nd of May. He died at the age of 25 after 73 days on strike, the longest of the 1981 strikers and one day shorter than Tarek's Terence McSweeney, who was a former member of Cork City, uh, a former mayor of Cork City. Now, while on hunger strike, he was elected as an anti-H block TD for Cavan Monaghan constituency in the 1981 general election, which was held in Ireland on the 11th of June. He received 15.1% first preference votes and was elected on the fourth count. He is the shortest serving Dáil deputy ever, having served for only two months, but the two seats gained by the anti-H block candidates denied Taoiseach Charles Hawhey the chance to form a government and the 22nd Dáil saw Fina Gael Labour Party coalition come, to, come into office with Garrett Fitzgerald as Taoiseach. Karen Doherty, Irish freedom fighter, rest in peace.
Let me introduce myself. My name is Thomas McAlee. In life, I was a proud IRA man. You may have heard of me. Born in the parish of Balahi, sixth to a family of 12, I was raised with love and faithfulness in spite of the grip Britain held. At the age of 11, I developed an interest in all things power-driven. I could take apart and reassemble any motor I was given. There was gaiety and laughter, dances, music, and the crack. My cousin Francis Hughes and I knew much about that. But then it seemed the jolliness was fading as darkness quickly moved in. The Brits were slamming us with raids, with beatings, and with constant shootings. At the age of 14, I joined Nafina Aaron and used my knowledge of mechanics and gave it back to them. It wasn't long till Francis and I were right in the thick of the fight, defending our local area, ambushing the soldiers as we might. Our tactics proved our usefulness and soon we were part of the IRA, blitzing through South Derry keeping that enemy at bay. From just one miscalculation, our lives took a different turn. A bomb went off prematurely and left many of us hurt. My right eye was destroyed and my left not too much better, Colin losing several toes and Sean himself a lake. Captured, tried and imprisoned, a new fight was upon us. Who knew the Brits could be so cruel as they tried to crush our spirit? With Bobby Sands as our leader, we fought back with our strongest defense. We sacrificed our own young lives as had many done before us. This day we watch from heaven and see the goal is near. It's up to you, my comrades, to finish this job so dear. So do not mourn or cry for us, nor offer us rest in peace. It's your time now. Take your place with us and make Ireland one nation free. Thomas McAuley, Irish freedom fighter. Michael James Devine was born on May 26, 1954 in the Springtown camp on the outskirts of Derry. It was a former army base from the Second World War, which Mickey described as the slum to end all slums. His family moved to a new development in 1960 in Cragen. Mickey had an unremarkable but reasonably happy childhood. He went to primary school in Cragen, and at the age of 11, he went to St. Joseph's Secondary School, which he attended until he was 15. The first civil rights march in Derry took place on October 5, 1968, when the sectarian RUC batoned several hundred protesters at Duke Street. Recalling that day, Mickey, who was then only 14, wrote, like every other young person in Derry, my whole way of thinking was tossed upside down by the events of October 5, 1968. I didn't even know there was a civil rights march until I saw it on television. But that night, I was downtown smashing shop windows and stoning the earth, and overnight I developed an intense hatred for the RUC. Later, on two occasions in 1969, Mickey ended up at the wrong end of the RUC baton and consequently ended up in the hospital. That summer, Mickey left school. During 1970 and 1971, Mickey became involved in the civil rights movement and with the local militant labor party and the young socialists. Later, Mickey, by this time 17 years of age and politically mature and had joined the officials also known as the Sticks. His political affiliation expanded when he became a member of the James Conley Republican Club. And then shortly after a member of the Derry Brigade of the official IRA. Bloody Sunday, January 30th, 1972, when British paratroopers shot dead 13 unarmed civil rights demonstrators in Derry was a turning point for Mickey. 
From then, there was no turning back on his Republican commitment, and he was to become a full-time political and military activist. The slaughter confirmed to Mickey that it was more than time to start. How, he would ask, can you sit back and watch while your own dairy men are shot down? It was then that he became involved not only in defensive operations, but in various gun attacks against British troops. Through 1973, Mickey remained connected with the sticks. His activist efforts led him in late 1974 to join the newly formed Irish Republican Socialist Party. He became a founding member of the PLA, People's Liberation Army. And in early 1975, he also became a founding member of the INLA, Irish National Liberation Army. Mickey Devine was the last hunger striker to die. Irish freedom fighter.